say. And then of course in April we got Returnal from Housemark. and though there have been a lot of talk about whether or not it should have some save states in it, it definitely showed that Housemark can make a pretty impressive uh, third person action game that really takes advantage of what the PS5 is doing and things like the DualSense and 3D audio. It's a, it's a really nice mix of showing off what a next gen game can be. Sadly, still, Big system selling games remain the Achilles heel for Microsoft. We're six months in and there is exactly one, yes one, game that is completely exclusive to the next gen Xbox, uh, meaning not available on PlayStation, not available on Xbox One. That game's the medium. And you know, hey, it's a good game, but it's not exactly, uh, you know, pumping as much next gen iron in the gym as say Returnal is or Demon's Souls, but still first party reinforcements are coming for Microsoft. And the good news is, once they finally do arrive, it's probably never gonna stop again. I mean, they bought Bethesda after all. That's a, that's a lot of reinforcements. You know, they are gonna kick it off. They got this year. So Microsoft Flight Simulator, which looks like it's gonna be a next gen only release on console. And then of course, Halo Infinite in the fall. On the Bethesda side, we're still not quite sure what's gonna happen with Starfield. Is it gonna be exclusive? Is there some sort of deal there with Sony like there was with Deathloop and and Ghostwire Tokyo, but if indeed Starfield is exclusive, that is going to be the ace of Microsoft's sleeve. You've got a new Todd Howard game that could be exclusive to Xbox. But Jonathan, one area where Microsoft obviously wins by a one-punch TKO, Mike Tyson's Punch-Out style, is game subscription services. Xbox Game Pass is so good, my friend, that it has actually stolen one of your exclusives. MLB The Show is on Game Pass on Xbox, and it used to be, of course, a complete and total Sony exclusive. So that's awesome. Uh, other cool stuff recently, you've got the previously Switch exclusive Octopath Traveler, Destiny 2, more, 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 it just keeps coming. All that stuff has helped keep us entertained while we're still waiting on the big exclusives on the Microsoft side. And even better, xCloud is now rolling out to iOS devices, to Apple stuff, so that pretty soon, anybody with a smartphone, which is basically everyone, that has a Game Pass Ultimate subscription is gonna be able to play their games not only on their console, but from anywhere through their phone at no extra cost for Game Pass Ultimate subscribers. That's just a totally impossible to ignore force in the entire games industry when you take all of that as a whole. Now, if only games with gold didn't suck now, but you know, I can't really complain. It's, uh, it is definitely a strange time to say a PlayStation developed game costs more on PlayStation than on Xbox if you have subscription services on both. It is a, a very strange place to be. And it, it's, of course, you're completely right. You, you can't compare what PlayStation is offering to Game Pass. Just nothing stacks up. But at least in a vacuum thinking of what PlayStation players have been dealing with, things have been largely the same getting into the PS5 generation. But at the very least, I'd say PlayStation Plus's games lineup each month has been a lot better. Definitely when they pared down the lineup of games on PS Plus from six down to two, they didn't really find a way to up the value there or, you know, keep the value the same. And for a while, PS Plus kind of felt like a waste with those games. But thankfully, since the launch of the PS5, we've gotten almost a brand new PlayStation 5 game every month on PS Plus as part of that lineup. Stuff like Destruction All-Stars, Bug Snacks, Oddworld Soulstorm, and Maquette. Obviously, again, it does not compare to the game after game that is coming to Game Pass, but at least taken for what PS Plus was, it's nice to see them adding a little bit of value. Of course, probably the closest thing to Game Pass that PlayStation actually does offer is PlayStation Now, but they really haven't brought that service into the generation of the PS5. You can play it on PS5, but they don't allow PlayStation 5 games yet to be a part of the service. And this really came to a head when they added Borderlands 3 and Marvel's Avengers to PlayStation Now, but only the PS4 versions. It's, it's strange, especially to be in a place where there is a subscription service that does have a library of games and does span genres that PlayStation could really be bolstering, but it just doesn't match up to what Game Pass offers. And it's, it's becoming painfully more clear as the months go on.
Now on the peripheral side, talking about things being a little bit the same as what we've gotten before, the PlayStation 5 launched with a, a decent amount of peripheral support, like a pretty good charging station that was kind of in the look and feel of the PS5's new, very ostentatious design. We got the Pulse 3D headset that takes a really great advantage of the built-in 3D audio of the PS5 and is really affordable, especially compared to some other high-end headphones and, uh, you know, a few things like that, including the media remote, the, the one peripheral we've all been trying to actually get our hands on. And while we only had the single option for the DualSense controller at launch, luckily PlayStation has revealed that we are getting two new colors to add to the DualSense lineup. Those include Cosmic Red, which is a red and black colorway, as well as a Midnight Black colorway, which is entirely black and aligned a little bit more with past PlayStation controllers at launch. So those are two options that we know of right now, and Sony definitely loves to introduce new colors as generations go on, so I wouldn't be surprised if this is just the start. We haven't quite been able to get any sense of what's to come other than some PlayStation VR uh, new controllers that'll be on the horizon, but that is way down the line. At the very least, third-party headsets are compatible with the PlayStation 5, so if you're not a fan of the Pulse headset but do want to take advantage of 3D audio, there are some other options for you. Unfortunately, I think the biggest thing when it comes to PS5 and peripherals is an advantage the PlayStation is supposed to have over Xbox but just hasn't happened yet, and that is a more... Uh, accessible opportunity to get expandable storage. PlayStation has said the PS5 will be compatible with third-party drives that as long as they match the speeds of the internal SSD, players will be able to expand that internal storage. But we don't have information about what drives those will be, from what companies, when that will be incorporated into the PlayStation 5. We're, we're just kind of left waiting, and that's really a big problem when there are only 667 gigs of available data on the PS5 at launch. That's maybe two Call of Duties these days. It really doesn't stack up to being much in the long run. And so that's already a problem we're getting to six months in of a lot of people having to play Tetris with their, their game files basically on their hard drive. So hopefully that gets resolved soon, and I do think that will be an advantage the PS5 will have over Xbox, but as of right now, it really isn't. Yeah, for now, Microsoft's got their one terabyte storage card. I've got one in there. In fact, I'm already onto it because these big games of this new generation take up a lot of space. So it's good to have, even if it's expensive. Now, uh, since launch though, Microsoft has added the new Xbox wireless headset, which is uh, roughly an analog to the, the Pulse 3D headset for Sony. I really like it a lot. It's, I think, for $100, which is what it costs. I think you get a lot for your money. It sounds good. I like the minimalist design. And what I really like is that it can be paired with your smartphone at the same time or any Bluetooth device. And so you can actually be chatting on Discord with your friends while also playing an Xbox game and getting the audio from your Xbox at the same time, which is pretty cool. Microsoft removed the optical port <laughs> from the Xbox Series X, just like Sony did with the PS5. So we kind of needed this. It was a little bit of a bummer. It wasn't there at launch, but now there is this good option. So that's really good. Plus, uh, I want to give a special shout out to Microsoft for pumping out a whole bunch of cool new colors since launch for their controllers. I've got the, the Pulse Red one right here. It's nice to have something besides just the default black, so I appreciate them for that. But Jonathan, controller colors aren't the only things being updated, the consoles are too. Now on the Xbox side, the Series X actually hasn't really had any major updates because it hasn't needed them. Pretty much all the functionality that was needed was right there on day one, which is great, but Microsoft still added some good stuff. Most notably, Quick Resume has been improved, and there's a new optional Suspend mode that can help speed up your game downloads, which as we talked about, these games are huge, so being able to speed those up is always appreciated. And then probably the coolest one of all is FPS Boost, the backwards compatibility team continuing to crush it at Microsoft. There are now almost 100, as we record this, almost 100 backward compatible games that run are boosted up to either 60 frames per second if they were originally 30 and some games even go up to 120 frames per second like Titanfall 2 which is one of the best games of the last 5-10 years which rocks. We've also seen Microsoft drop the Xbox Live subscription requirement for over 50 free to play games which I do admit that's more of a course correction than a welcome new addition but still great. 
yeah, it, it's always good to see advancement like that. That was definitely something that happened with uh, PlayStation finally allowing crossplay last generation. I very much understand. Yeah, we're, the PlayStation is in a very different place because whereas Xbox sort of unified its UI across generations and made everything very familiar for jumping into the Series X, PlayStation opted to do a brand new user interface. And while it's certainly cool to have a new nice and shiny UI to, to look at at launch, that means some new problems come up that maybe PlayStation had fixed on the PS4 even years ago. Uh, so we're in a bit of a strange place, but we did thankfully get our first really big PS5 major software update in April, I believe it was. And with that came a few important and needed updates, such as uh, allowing support for 120 hertz displays, uh, and finally the ability to store PS5 games on USB extend expanded storage, excuse me. You can't still play it off of that, but at least you can actually put PS5 games somewhere other than the internal SSD. And there were a few other added social and interface features that really helped improve things that people have been having issues with since launch. Uh, but that said, even with that update, there are still a lot of things fans are asking for. I think, you know, especially after Returnal, we're seeing a lot of ask for some sort of quick resume analogous feature to come to PlayStation. There have been things like wanting var variable refresh rate to come, the expandable storage issues I mentioned before, and of course, even just small things that have popped up since launch, like people are pretty unhappy with the way trophies are presented on PlayStation 5 because it's, it's clunkier than they were on PS4 and it didn't need to be. So there's definitely some work that's going to have to go in to the PS5's UI in the months to come. And so it's been really great to see PlayStation addressing things already with an update like that one in April and some smaller performance updates, both for the system and the DualSense since the PlayStation 5 launched in November. But that said, this whole span since that launch hasn't exactly been the smoothest for the PS5. Now, thankfully, there hasn't been anything that is as ubiquitous or widespread as the Red Ring of Death from the Xbox 360 era. But pretty much since launch day, there was sort of a whack-a-mole situation going on where a new PS5 issue seemed to crop up up every few days, and so it's been hard to say what are the most proliferated issues that players have been having, how much of the player base actually saw these, but definitely one of the ones that we've seen stick around is DualSense controller drift. The, the, we've definitely seen some stick drift there that PlayStation is now facing a class action lawsuit because of, very similarly to Nintendo with the Nintendo Switch Joy-Con drift. That said, th there have been a few other issues such as rest mode bugs and occasionally downloading the PS4 version of the game when you wanted the PS5 version, but thankfully again, nothing has been catastrophic across the board, but it, it's been a sort of strange, oh, what's that new issue I'm hearing about today? <laughs> On the Xbox side here, Series X owners complaining uh, here and there of controller drift again and random disconnects, but other than that, really, the console's been pretty much working as designed. It is quiet, it is cool, it is powerful. There haven't been any major OS issues, crashes, any other real problems of note that I've seen out in the community. Basically, I would say it's been pretty smooth sailing on the Xbox side. In fact, probably the best launch Microsoft could have possibly hoped for on the hardware side outside of the very obvious and very frustrating and sadly very ongoing supply issues. And there you have it. The first six months of the newest console generation are behind us. Of course, there is plenty more ahead and we'll be covering all the latest news, releases, and more on IGN as well as on our weekly show, Next Gen Console Watch. Be sure to tune in, follow along with us as the journey of the PS5 and Xbox Series X continues and keep it locked to IGN. That 
which commanded the stars, giving life its fullest brilliance. The Elden Ring. Oh, Elden Ring. Shattered by someone or something. Tell me you don't see it. Look up at the sky. It burns. The world is filled with stories of legendary heroes and treacherous villains. Of fantastical creatures and wondrous places where nature and magic live in perfect harmony. Not all stories have happy endings. But yours has yet to be written.
just the feeling of like being in a firefight and hearing the, the click of the gun, throwing it down, grabbing one off the wall. My gunner's upside down and he's like laying in. I see kill assist, kill assist, kill assist. Any pistol across any of the games. Whatever gun allows me to feel the most like John Wick, I am there. I remember how excited I was with like this big combat with vehicles going all over the place. Halo means something different for everyone, right? I think that that's what makes Halo great. What is Halo multiplayer? And for me, it boils down to this tight arena style combat and big team battle, this wide open vehicle infused uh, kind of combat. We're taking that awesome legacy or classic Halo combat experience and modernizing it in ways that'll feel fresh to old players and really exciting to new players. We're gonna give you great ways to customize your Spartan, really make your super soldier your own, and we're kicking off a journey, an experience that's gonna evolve month to month, season to season, year after year. For me, working through this multiplayer of this game, and the toughest challenge I think was really about how do we respect the legacy of what came before us, but still build something that feels new. We've tried to bring all these elements of legacy and really inject them into Halo Infinite, not just like in a, in, a, in a way where you kind of won't notice it, where you feel like, oh, they really designed this to be a celebration of previous Halo, as well as an iteration of where Halo can go next. The vision of Arena was all about a tight experience. It was all about being fair. It was all about earning everything on the map, earning everything, every kill you get. Going back to like, what is the core foundation of what made the great Halo multiplayer arena matches great. Halo, it's really about fair and balanced starts. So everybody's on equal footing when they come off the rip. And then once they start running around, it's about scavenging, it's about finding new toys and, and kind of developing your play style as you run through the match. What makes Halo feel like Halo? Um, I feel like uh, the answer to that question is, is the sandbox. Like, the sandbox is Halo. When we set out to look at Halo Infinite from a high level and the direction of what it is, there's lots of exciting things there because we really wanted to push what are the things that are true to Halo, but what are the things that fans haven't seen yet? Equipment is back, but equipment is kind of, has, the, has, a, has a bigger voice than ever before. We ask questions to ourselves of, uh, if you could go after you know, a power weapon to get a bunch of kills, uh, would you do that or could you go and get grapple to make sure that you swing yourself to the other side of a map to back cap a stronghold? We saw that as like another avenue of not just skill expression, but tactics for teams to coordinate around. The exciting combinatory nature of, you know, this toy plus this toy and how those interact with objectives is super amazing. Looking at how the power-ups play, like your classic power-ups, like the overshield and the active camouflage. For this title, what we're looking at, what we're excited for, is you pick that up and you choose when you activate it. It goes into your inventory. If you haven't used it and someone kills you in multiplayer, you drop that overshield and then they can take it, use it for themselves. That to me is very legacy, but we took the equipment side of it and modernized it. When it comes to the vehicles, we went in and decided to invest a lot in the, the systems. When I take damage in my Warthog, uh, my, my wheels can get blown off, my hood can get blown off. There's different aspects of the vehicle that change how my vehicle handles now. And that's something that's brand new. The other thing we added to that is like this doomsday mechanic. So when you hit this threshold, the vehicle catches fire and it's very much, you've got a certain amount of health or a certain amount of time and you gotta choose what you wanna do with the last minutes of this vehicle. We've got a cousin to the Warthog, which is the Razorback. The back has this like multi-storage compartment that you can put a lot of stuff into. So if you want to put like detached turrets, power weapons, fusion coils, objectives, and that is what's really making uh, the Razorback kick a lot of butt in MP and campaign. The levels define pace for the game, how frantic it is, and they define that iconic fantasy for players as they're entering that match. What do they want to do? Um, what type of experience are they hoping to have? What kind of combat, what kind of dance floor is there available to have that combat in? For me, BTV is all about experiencing uh, the full extent of the sandbox of Halo in just one match, right? Like you see the vehicles, the weapons, the equipment. 
we really wanted to take that kind of concept, those feels you had, you know, playing the play, playing the previous games, and just turn the volume up. Vehicles are no longer just spawning at bases anymore. We have pelicans delivering them, and we have a commander in your ear telling you that pelicans are going to be dropping off these vehicles. Scorpion tank is inbound. We have. Halo 2 style Delta Halo mission weapon pods that fall from the sky to resupply the field. That's where it makes it feel like, like a real battlefield and, and it's very exciting. This is not just more players, this is just this certain beautiful slice of sci-fi chaos. The announcer is your big gameplay moments, your game modes, just like the way it was before. Play. Catch. Personal AI is really a reflection and information for the player. Personal AI, designation button. So if a player grabs a flag, your personal AI is going to tell you to, you know, get that thing back to base and give you some like moment-to-moment -moment updates. Our team took the enemy flag. What if we can let players choose their own AI, and each one of those are different voices, so that players can find the one that fits their personality and their mood the best? They they add to the sense of like me, as a, as a Spartan being more important and, and for us in multiplayer it is really about becoming a Spartan, your Spartan. You are you inside of the Halo universe. The body of customization content that we have on day one ensures that there will be millions of customization combinations for Spartans on the battlefield. That includes things like armor coatings, uh, armor emblems, various armor effects, down to the individual armor pieces, so your shoulders, your gloves, your knee pads, your helmet, your visor, your helmet attachments. Then you look at weapons, and we've got a whole slew of customization offerings there. Vehicles have a, have a huge pool of customizations too. We support customization in the game. Players can do the same thing on HaloWaypoint.com as well as the Halo Waypoint app. The player also customizes the Spartan, the soldier inside the suit. We want the Spartan to represent the player as much as possible. They can change their body type and their voice as well as choose prosthetics for the first time. Coatings offer us a unique opportunity to craft some hyper-polished looks and let you express yourselves in ways you've never been able to before. We're coming at this from a player first mentality. So what that means is that there's no random loot in this. There's no loot boxes. It's very important to us that everyone understands exactly how they unlock customization content. And we have a variety of places where they can do that. First off is the battle pass. The Halo battle pass will never be taken away from you. And what I mean by that is once you buy it, it's yours and does not expire. In future seasons, you can purchase old battle passes as well as the current battle pass and choose which battle pass to put your progression towards. All of these rewards are single source, so you're never gonna be confused about where things come from. If you can unlock something in the battle pass, we're not gonna let any other players circumvent that by purchasing it out of the storefront. A lot of our stuff is unlocked through playing the game and only through playing the game. All customization is just cosmetic. Every season will have its own theme and introduce new components, new looks, new gameplay for players, new opportunities to earn and collect cool rewards. We've seen the, the Samurai already. That's one of our event armor cores, and that's gonna be something that players can earn through gameplay for free. With us going free to play for the multiplayer part of the game, like that was a big goal because, you know, how do we have a way we can always bring players in, right? And they can, when we have a new update, there's, there's They'll just dip their toes in if they even just want to see it. Not only are we free to play, but we're free to play on PC as well as console. And what that means is we're able to get the biggest audience we've ever had. I mean, everybody gets to play with no barriers. And even better, your progression carries from one platform to the next. Getting our game to be on PC and console at the same time is an amazing chance for us to really just kind of excite new players about the game. How can we do things like make cross-play interesting and like even in just customs being able to just play with your friends that like some people have PCs and some people have consoles and like let them talk to each other let them be friends why are you here to be a Spartan the Academy is a place that you can go uh, with an MP to kind of onboard into the experience it's great for newer players who are still picking up the controls and also people who want to warm up before they head into matchmaking it's a series of experiences both a tutorial to get started for the first time weapon drills to practice with specific items and also training mode that you can use to just get warm explore the game as you want to for players who are new to halo let's help them learn what this universe is about 
some of these characters. What, what are they about? And help them kind of know the vocabulary that people have been speaking for now almost 20 years so that we, when they come in there, they don't feel like they're behind everyone else. They can kind of come in on an even footing. I mean, I'm super jazzed about bots. I think they're awesome. Our goal with bots has been to have a variety of difficulties that kind of provide a good training partner for wherever you're at in the experience. Partnering with our players on the road to launch and after launch is absolutely critical, right? I mean, Halo's always been about the community conversation. We want to make sure we hear our players, make changes where we can based on that feedback, make sure the game is ready for launch, and then even beyond launch. What I'm genuinely excited about is taking the game out of our hands and putting it into the community's hands. You know, whether it's seeing what people make in Forge or the content that they're able to create with theater, watching streamers go after the game. To get involved, you go to haloinsider.com, put in your info with your gamer tag, and we should be able to reach out to you if we want to invite you to a Halo Infinite flight. We feel like we've got a pretty good selection at launch and what's going to be there for our fans. And this isn't going to be something that is just a static set of items. We have some new stuff in the works already and just can't wait to really get into that as soon as this game comes out. New maps, new modes, new ways to customize your Spartan. Launch is just the beginning. Now we're just going to be able to talk, interact more frequently. And that's just going to be great. That is the future of Halo Infinite multiplayer. Thank you to the community for all their feedback over the years so far. And uh, I'm looking forward to the road to launch, launch itself, and beyond. just a totally impossible to ignore force in the entire games industry when you take all of that as a whole. Now, if only games with gold didn't suck now, but you know, I can't really complain. It's uh, it is definitely a strange time to say a 